Welcome to Inspirational Transformational TV Show. Amy Whitney here today with Lisa Coleman and Renee St. Pierre. Lisa and Renee join me today to discuss the experience of having their father pass over from terminal cancer. It's a really important interview, I think, today because a number of viewers contact me following deaths within their family of loved ones. And I believe it's Lisa in the interview. She talks about the death of someone that you love is one of the most pivotal moments of your life. And so to have the girls on here today to share their experience and to share their discoveries of, of what their father's death actually was to them, which was actually a gift. It was a gift for their transformation. It was a catalyst for the girls to, to strive and to rise to their full potential. The way that they experience the passing of their father and have grown from it and are open enough to share these uh, experiences today is absolutely beautiful. Enjoy the show. Renee and Lisa, thank you so much for joining me today. No problem, no worries. Now, it's actually our Christmas special for 2011 that this is going to uh, be posted, so I thought it was lovely that I would have two sisters on here, um, and you both have incredible stories. Um, we were chatting a bit off camera, and I think, Lisa, you're going to take us back to, even back to your childhood, is that right? Mm -hmm. um, I've always, since I was a little child, I've always, I've, I was overweight and always struggled with self-confidence and, and that sort of thing, and... Um, I was teased quite a bit as a as a child growing up from public school all the way through high school, and uh, I even remember um, like when I was I was being teased at home or sorry I was being teased at school and I'd come home looking for some support from my mom and she couldn't offer it to me and I just remember thinking well, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> you should be saying this to comfort me. Um, you know, so I guess I've always had, I've had to learn from a young age how to become, I guess, emotionally uh, independent and, and learning how to uh, take care of myself and and, and understanding. Um, I, it's like, it's been a lifelong journey for me with self-confidence. I'm still, I think I'm at a, definitely a better stage now than where I was even say three years ago or even six months ago but it's been a lifelong journey for me to um, learn about uh, self-confidence and the importance of being who I am and believing in who I am and uh, it um, it kind of uh, had, and now becoming a mother it's really ha um, thrown um, a loop into things and the idea is like how how, how do I want to be as a parent or as a mother in the eyes of my child? Um, you know, what kind of things do I want to offer that um, I never maybe didn't get the support that I needed maybe? And how can I, when, if it ever happens, how can I offer those things to my child? Um, so I've had transformations throughout my whole life, but uh, the biggest transformation was when my dad passed away. Um, in the idea of really changing my thought process and my lifestyle and, and understanding and believing in who who I was. Um, for me, when uh, I, when my dad got sick, um, I really, because he had been the first person that I had ever known to, to watch um, pass away, but also to see that that transition from being healthy to not being healthy anymore and it was uh it was quite um I don't even know I don't even know how to put it into words like it uh for me I just remember the one time when dad was uh he, he was weaker and he was losing his abilities to do things on his own and I just remember because our dad was a huge he was a big guy he was like six foot four you know 300 pound sort of guy and he was just this big man and he had this big voice and he was very he was just a big strong man and I remember the one time I was at the hospital and I saw him and I looked and there it took like three people to get him out of bed and 
he was just skin and bone and couldn't walk anymore, couldn't do anything on his own. And it really, I think it was, that was probably my turning point right there um, in the idea of acceptance. And like, I just, I didn't know that he wasn't invincible, that he wasn't. Yeah. Thank you. Like he, that he, he was, he even, he was my dad. Like in my eyes, he'd always been my dad and he was indestructible and he mm. was, you know, he was so strong and he was so smart and he just, you know, but when I saw him that physically declining, um, that I think was probably the hardest thing I'd ever mm -hmm. seen, you know, it like just to see him be so weak and so unable and so in de like so dependent on other people and not able to communicate anymore. It really affected me and I think is where I kind of started my transition of like I can I'm I'm not invincible either you know I I have to I, um, I mean I don't think it all came in the same at the same day but as time went on and then I started to really realize that he he really was going to pass on like this wasn't something he was going to get over um, I guess is when I kind of started this new journey of of life and understanding that um we're only here for a short time and um and it it just really opened my eyes to how much control we actually can have in our lives and our own health and because I found I found especially since dad passed away and then with our mother um like that generation it really has a um, a dependence upon authoritative people and trusting everything that they tell them instead of, you know, taking what people say, but then, um, maybe doing some, their own, your own research on it and maybe deciding for yourself what you'll take and what you'll throw out. Mm -hmm. Um, cause I find that they were both just, whatever the doctor said, they're like, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. No questions asked. So your parents were still together. You weren't from a divorced family. Or? No. All right. Yeah, they they were still together. And when you talk about in your childhood how you came home looking for that support, mm -hmm. did you both find that in in when you were raised that um, the emotional connection wasn't there? Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Like dad was dad could be supportive because yeah. dad struggled as well as a child with being teased because he was such he's a big, a big man. kid. Yeah. By the time, like, he was the same probably size as an adult as he was when he was, like, 16 years old. So he, I remember having conversations with dad about um, how, you know, just don't worry. Like, you know, mm -hmm. they're just they're just kids because, you know, and, and they're not, um, like, he, he, I remember him saying that, like, he had told me stories about struggles that he had had yes. about being teased and made fun of and that sort of thing and... Um, and that kind of made me feel a little bit better, but mom, on the other hand, didn't, she didn't understand. No, she, and that. she said that she's like, nobody ever made fun of me. So I don't know what you want me to say. <laughs> and I remember being like seven and I'm like, well, that's not what you're supposed to say to me. <laughs> but that's her truth. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. true. Right. But yeah. even now as adults and, and mom, even as an adult still doesn't really she doesn't know how to provide doesn't that really, no. emotional support. Even with watching her husband die, she didn't yeah. go through any... Yeah, no. yeah, because that's that's our new struggle <laughs> that we have She's our new, with, with mom. Yeah. yeah. So your father, you mentioned off camera that his illnesses started quite young in his life. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, very young. Like he had... I, well, there was things that he had had that had happened to him. As a child, but we didn't really we didn't know, no. we didn't learn about them until after. Um, like he had some issues with his feet. And yeah, as like a really young. He's a very secretive man when it came to his own health, and I think that's right. because he thought he was a very strong person. Right. He wanted to be strong for us too, but it wasn't until '97. So my I was, I'm the youngest of four. So okay. when I was 17, um, Chris and Steve were still like, out of school, out of our house, I think, and that's when he said, "Oh, you have the kidney cancer." So they're going to operate on his kidney, and then three years later, he had the heart disease, so the bypass. Mm -hmm. So he's never lived a very healthy, at like, I guess, midlife. Yes. I guess that's what you call it. 
Um, so, but even when we were t like when I was seventeen, he was diagnosed with um, depression. Okay. And yeah. so I th that's kind of when everything kind of went. Yeah, just kind of went downhill from there. Because you've also spoke from this you realize the importance of emotions and thoughts and, yeah. and things like that yeah because um, going because going back to when i was in australia when dad was first when i found out he was diagnosed with a brain tumor i was in school and uh when i was talking with my family on the phone they're like we think the doctors think you should come home so i remember getting all my stuff ready and it's like a 19 hour flight so you had lots of time to think but I'm just thinking to myself that a brain tumor, because I'm a very, even though I'm a scientist at heart, but I'm a firm believer that cancer does come from anger and depression and all of those different emotions, that a rage that you've just kept shoving down. Mm -hmm. And if you don't talk about them or don't get them out, then it's really going to affect your health, um, even the way you look, like your skin, the uh, your hair and everything. So I'm a just firm believer that that's exactly what happened with him because of his depression and his silence with mom and like they they never talked and yeah uh, so take us back to you were on the plane coming home and the the brain cancer is actually what caused the death of your father yes when you arrived home was there a, a, a startling difference in your family dynamics and your father <laughs> um well that's kind of interesting because um i don't no, I, I was a bit different, I guess. I I just, when I heard that he was diagnosed with brain cancer, I just, I had a feeling inside that that was it. Like, he was going to die, and I had to accept it. So I, I personally never went through um, a very hard emotion, like taking it very hard, like mm -hmm. his death. Because um, I think I, I accepted it right from the get-go. Right. Um, but there was a huge change in the way our family worked like we have two older brothers mm -hmm. and uh, Lisa and I got closer through this like okay. um, and then our brothers kind of we grew apart almost with the boys yeah and uh, I don't know like it's it was a hard dynamic and I didn't really have anything to say because I wasn't there that whole year prior to all of this happening like they understood it more than I did I just knew I came home back to the country and my father was passing away so yeah I remember picking her up because I picked her up from the airplane or the airport and just dumped because <laughs> I I was there for the whole like yeah brief, like you know when it was happening and um and I I don't know if it's just part of my journey but people were just dumping on me and like they're like people, the angry, their anger and their frustrations. Like everybody, I felt was just taking it out on me. Um, and then when Renee finally came home, I was like, "Oh my God!" You're like, Grandma's saying this, Mom saying this, Chris is saying this, Steve's saying this. You know, like everybody's and Renee. And I remember Renee. She just started to cry, and she was like, "What has happened to our family?" Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, "I don't know." Mm -hmm. Like it just, it was hard. Because, um, like, mom didn't want to, she still, as far as I'm concerned, doesn't want to deal with it. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But even when dad was sick, like, she wouldn't go to the doctor with him. Like, when he was trying to find out what was going on, like, she would just, he'd go by himself or she'd call me. Like, I was living in that area at the time. So she'd be like, can you go with your dad to the doctors? Can you, or she'd call Steve and ask him to go take dad. Like, she just didn't. She just didn't want to deal with it, right? right? But then when it got to the point where she... It was in our face now, like, the day that he was diagnosed, I went with him to the hospital, like, or to the doctors. Or sorry, it was the hospital, because they finally decided, after, like, two and a half months, oh, maybe we should check his brain. You know, because he had been... Th and, I mean, looking back now, like, all the symptoms were there. Like, he was throwing up, he was tired, he had headaches beyond mm -hmm. belief, and... And they were testing for neurological issues, and is they, that right? And they were testing his stomach, for the most part, okay. until it wasn't, until then, after, the it was near the end of August, when mom had said, like, he was up on the tractor and said something really, really weird, and she was like, no, and that was when she finally went to the doctor with dad and said, there was really something wrong, and then he was like, oh, okay, maybe we should do a CAT scan now, and I remember the day that we went to the, um, to get the CAT scan done, because I'm, 
we went, it was in Leamington and we had to go to the hospital. Then, so we had to go down into the basement and we're in the elevator and dad, like, and this lady was in the elevator with us and dad reaches over and he's like, just does something really creepy to this woman. And I'm like, this is not my dad, you know? And then we're sitting in the waiting room and he has to fill out the, um, the form to say he's giving permission to have the dye injected and that sort of thing. And he couldn't, like, he couldn't read it. Like, I sat there and I, I read it, like, seven times over and over it before. Wasn't registered. Yeah. And then even when they took him in, the nurse came out and she's like, you need to sign this as well because we don't think he understands. You know, but even, and even then, the nurse was looking at me like, how could you let it get, it's like they knew something, but they're like, how could you let it get this far sort of feeling? Dumping on you. Like yeah. You said, everything. Yeah. You know, and I'm just thinking... Don't blame me. Like he's had a doctor for how many years, and you know, and so that day, and then and then I knew too because they they're like, oh, we, you need to go back. You need to go sit in the emergency room, um, waiting room. And then at that point, I was like, okay, why is everybody else leaving? But they're making us stay, sort of thing, right? And then, but again, like Dad kept saying, he's like, no, we can go, we can go. He's like, they're just gonna send the results, and. Uh, you know, I'll just get him from Dr. Eaton and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, Dad, we have to stay. You know, so I, I, I still believe to this day that Dad knew, again, cause, but he was so secretive. Right. But I still feel he knew way before any of us did, mm -hmm. but just wasn't. he Because another time I'd met him at the hospital prior to that, like he had gone for more stomach testing and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I drove over to meet him there, just, you know, even just to offer some support and company. And he told me to leave. Okay. Yeah. He's like, just go. And I'm like, you know, but no, like I'll stay because, yeah. you know, he's like, no, I don't want you here. So what was his process like transitioning to death? Did he struggle? Yeah. Personally, do you think he struggled? Well, I think because if I he did, he didn't show it to me. I think to a point was when, I think there came a point where he realized it was too late. Yeah. There was no turning well, yeah. back. Because he had had all these other close calls and mm -hmm. and made and survived. And survived. Um, because he had at one point, I guess, just before he passed away, he said to mom, um, "He's like, I wish I would have done something earlier." Like he had made that sort of comment, or I wish I would have. Um, uh, I wish I would have looked at or something about accepting the symptoms or. Or, like, as he had acknowledging. been acknowledging the symptoms, yeah, mm -hmm. a lot sooner. Because I think... But I, I saw him... I felt that I saw him go through the four stages. Like, I didn't understand the stages till after when I went back to school and I was learning about the four stages of death. But I could definitely, when I think back, I could see him. Because after he had his surgery, he was really angry for a while. Like, he... Not, not towards us, but he was really angry with Mom. Like, he... So I think there was some frustration, like there was more like to that, like right. I think there was a lot of regret and that sort of thing that was coming out and, um, and I saw it towards mom and mom and then I'd, he I'd heard it from mom about the things that he would say to her and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so there was just, I think a lot of emotions mm -hmm. that, um, and I know like many times I would be sitting with mom and she's like. I just want to tell him this. I just want to tell... And I'm like, just tell him then. You know, because I knew at one point... I th well, um, there was kind of a process where I had... I figured out too. I was like, no, this is... Dad's not going to get through this. Which was probably like mid-October. Okay. You know? and But that from that point on, I... Anytime I saw... It, like, I didn't know when it was going to happen. I didn't... You know, but I had a lot of unresolved issues as a teenager. Because Dad and I kind of clashed quite a bit as teen as me as a teenager but I think because him and I were, we were the same yeah he thought he was right and I thought I was right and that was just yeah. I was probably the most vocal one out of the four of us and like I would be the one to tell him <laughs> what I thought and he didn't like that <laughs> you know so it was there was that sort of those kind of unresolved things but I started to realize that you know that's because I like I'm not I wasn't the same person like I was 17 then and I'm yes. not 17 now and 
you know, so I, I really searched, did a lot of soul searching, um, you know, for forgiveness. And, and I, I really, because I didn't know when dad was going to go, like every time I saw him, I just, I told him I loved him. Like I, I closed every time, yes. you know? And, um, so when he did pass away, like I had no, no regrets, no, oh, I should have said this. I should have said yes. that. Like I really worked at making sure that he knew that I loved him no matter what. And it mm. wasn't about the past, you know, it was about the, the, the adult and the human being that he helped me become up to this point, you know? That's beautiful. Yeah. And I felt that, especially after he passed away, um, I definitely, I, I mean, I'm really sure Renee felt the same way, but I was definitely at a crossroad, you know, where I could continue on the path that I was leading or I could make a change and become a better person. Um, you know, not that I was a bad person, but just like a better in a health sense and a mental health sense and yes. spiritual and that sort of thing. And, um, because, but for the longest time, like I remember what got me through a lot of it was I, of course, like there was many days where I just want to lay in bed and not do anything, but I was like, I didn't want dad's death to be in vain. And I felt that if I didn't make better choices and do better things, then right. Learn from his exactly mistakes. than his, mm -hmm. you know, because I, I honest, re I really felt as like I know it sounds weird, but I, I almost believe that he like that was his journey, mm -hmm. yes. you know, yeah. to pa to to go through that journey to die that way to help to us, help us. Um, mm -hmm. you know, to become who he really really did want us to become, yeah. you know, because I, I after the after he died I when I really started to tap into like who I was and that sort of mm -hmm. thing, I went back to school and I was being, I was becoming really successful with my education and that sort of thing. And I'm like, Oh, you know, like I, I really did. I kept saying, I was like, no wonder dad and I fought so much, you know, cause I really, I was more, I think because he saw somebody that I, he saw a potential in me that I hadn't seen, yes. mm -hmm. you know, but it was, but then I when like literally as, like not as, as soon as, but when he died, like all of a sudden this whole new world. Well, I felt when he died, I felt closer to him Yeah. than I did when he was alive, which yeah. I know sounds weird, but I felt him constantly around me mm -hmm. and there for me, mm -hmm. you know, and, cause I had read, um, James Van Praan. I was reading one of his uh, novels. He was the, he was the co-writer of uh, Ghost Whisperer. Okay. So he's a, he was a medium. But I remember reading how he he said that a lot of times when people when loved ones weren't able to help their loved ones on in physical. on a physical level when they were here on the physical earth that they could help they could help them from the spiritual side mm -hmm. and they could help everybody that they've always wanted to help you know mm -hmm. and I really felt that like mm -hmm. I felt that like whether it was just in my own mind or whether it was really happening but I really I've never been I've never felt so successful and so accomplished than I have in the, my last like four years mm -hmm. of my life you know and it just Beautiful. yeah like I just feel that um I've come like because I, I had struggled for so many years with you know my self-confidence and what I wanted to do with my life and who I wanted to be. And I was like, I went from job to job to job, you know, and then all of a sudden I just, I was like, no, I can do something. I'm meant to be, I'm here for a reason. I'm meant to do something. And I, and what did you study when, when, did you go back to school once your father passed away? Or? I did. Yeah. Okay. He passed away in April. And then I started back in September at uh, Fanshawe with, for recreation and leisure. And I did two years there, and then now I'm at the University of Waterloo for therapeutic recreation. And I'm just, I'm taking the year off now for the baby, okay. but um, I'm like smack dab in the middle right now. Like I'm just in the middle of third year right now, and I have another two years to go. So. And, and you think you found your passion with that? Oh yeah, I just, it, um, they, I've always heard people say, find what you love, and find a way to make money at it sort of thing right and and I mean and I this job I do it for free like I mean obviously I want to get paid but I just feel so passionate about about it that um 
I do it. I do it for free if I could. It's just for me. I always knew that I always wanted to do something that helped people, yes. but I like I don't do well with blood or like that sort of stuff. So I was like, I, was, I get too queasy. Yeah. But this allows me to be able to help people and and um, and offer and like to see that because I I love to see that transition of people being sick, you know, or coming yes. from a, a lower. Um, Vitality. Ita- yeah, and then watching them transition into something better and, and being more independent and how being, rewarding. Yeah, mm-hmm. it uh, it's a great for me. For me, like I absolutely love it, and I just um, I've learned so much about. I think it's also it's helped me also with a lot of my transition because I've learned so much, like, I, like with psychology and behavioralism mm-hmm. and all that sort of thing. And I mean, I've probably become a client for myself, you know what I mean? Like being in class and I'm like, oh, I used to do that. You know, like... You need to heal or heal thyself. Yeah. It's, true. it's so true. Yeah. yeah, and I just... And then, you know, throw bouncing ideas off Renee and her bouncing ideas off of, of me and, like, we've just kind of together... Uh, like, it really has brought us close. Like, not... We've always been close, mm-hmm. but, as, like, as teenagers, like, every sister <laughs> fights with their sister, yeah. you know, but we... Um, and we've always had our differences and then even like different interests and different likes and dislikes. But this I found has really brought us Mm -hmm. like closer than I've ever, um, like I've ever felt like I've, I don't like now I feel like, um, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have Renee, you know, because I can, there's some ideas that I can't pass by anybody other, other people like I can, I don't feel, like when I'm talking to Renee, I don't feel like I'm being judged or I don't feel like, yes. you know. It's unconditional now. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, like we can we can joke about things, we can laugh about things, but we can also, like we can be very serious about our feelings and our emotions and, mm. you know, which um, with our brothers and our mom, we can't no. do that. Amazing. Like they're very weird that way. And so it's become a... <laughs> it's a different level. I, I yeah. Say. Yeah. Like today, um, like mom just is very, she's very negative, and which Renee and I really struggle with. Yeah. Um, well, I've had to change my relationship with my mom. Yeah. Also, be like self-destructive. Like I actually now, I believe I lost my mom when my dad passed away. Can you explain that? I don't know. Like she's not the same woman that okay. I know before and that it's probably because her husband of 34 years has passed away but I've had to take on a, a friendship role with her as opposed to mother daughter okay uh, because you know how when you you know somebody so well that you just you know you just take it for granted that like you yell at them you scream at them yeah. but with a true friend like I had to get that mentality of talking to her as a friend more so than a daughter mother right. because it, or else I just keep yelling at her. <laughs> and, I, and it has really helped me with our relationship nice. that way. But it's still struggling. Mm-hmm. Still struggling with how, her negativity. How was your experience? I know that you said right when you came back from Australia you accepted the fact your father was going to die. But did you have a, a transformation like Lisa in that it set you on a different path or um well it it kind of I think the whole transformation of when I left for Australia I remember going back taking us back some time there uh the day the night I we left to go to Toronto before she dropped us my husband and I off of the plane to go to Australia and I remember hugging dad and I know hindsight is twenty twenty, but I just had a feeling that that was the last time I was going to hug him as a healthy man as I knew right mm-hmm. or that he knew something that okay. he wasn't going to make it or something. He, and I remember he just said, just take care and, you know, I love you. And mm-hmm. uh, and then coming back, um, I think seeing him ill was, like you said, like this is my in, in, uh, invincible father who mm-hmm. this whole tumor has taken him down. Mm-hmm. And uh, to see a, a man like that struggle was just, it was hard. Um but I guess I, what, I was still in school. Like I was doing my thesis for a teacher's college. Yes. So I still had that to focus on. So I think that helped as well. Yes. Taking my mind off a few things here and there and talking with people. Like, I'm not, like, I will talk about anything. What, I don't care what people say about me. Like, I will discuss any possible thing that I need to just to get it off my chest. Yes. 
and that has helped. Um, but I remember the day that he did pass away. Um, it was a very weird thing, and uh, and I, I there's people that contest to this the day after and the week after because um, I was an atheist. I did not believe in God or another life. I'm a chemist at heart and a scientist at heart. And the day that he passed on and took his last breath, I felt I, I felt like a, a brush of something, like a, a, a oomph go through me. And then the room went cold, dark, and we, I knew he wasn't there. Yes. Like, it was just, the room was empty. Mm -hmm. It was There was like eight people still in there, but the room was empty. Wow. And... After that, I felt relief. And a week before that, what really changed me was my dreams. I had a dream of dad a week before he passed on, and he was healthy. He was the father that I knew, and he, um, I was, what's wrong with me? It's not Sorry. Okay. Um, so my dream, I, uh, I, my dad was there, and I remember there's a whole room of mirrors. The whole room was full of mirrors. I was the only one there with my dad. I couldn't see him in the mirror. So I turned to him and I said, "Are you dead?" And he's like, "Not yet." And I said, "Are you going to die?" And he said, "Soon." He's like, but I want you to know that I'm happy. I'm where I want to be. And I remember giving him a hug and like smelling him. And then I woke up and I just cried for like half an hour straight. I couldn't even stop myself from crying. And um, and then I had to go to my internship <laughs> placement of teaching the next day. Um, but it was a week after that he passed on. And I think that really, clo I had felt closure with him. Yes. Even though he was still with us. But when he died, I just felt closure with him. And then after that experience with the room being like he wasn't there, um, I was able to move on. Mm -hmm. So that led me on to a path of what the hell just happened. <laughs> Pretty much because of my logical scientist's mind yeah. couldn't think and couldn't rationalize what just happened. And um, so I started teaching um, at a high school. And uh, a colleague of mine really got me into meditation and what the mind can do and just being more, you know, just with peace and because uh, we connected with, because his father passed away and we're kind of from the same area. And the, after dad passed away and I started teaching, teaching really set me aside. Like I really had to focus on teaching because it was a full-time job. It was one of the jobs that I love doing, like Lisa said, like you find what you love to do and mm -hmm. just go with it, try to make money. Because when I go into school every day, it's just, it's, an, it's a, not even a job for me, it's just a daily routine that I do and luckily I just get paid for it. Awesome. So to me, that's what I set out to be, I guess. Um, but it was two years, two and a half years ago when I had another transformation with my health, my own health and our medical system with the um, numbing and tingling I felt on my right side of my face and all through my arm. And But eight pr days prior to that, I had fallen hard on my right side down some stairs. And then the tingling started, and I had a CT scan done. They saw the lesions, the, or the neurologist saw the lesions, and I went to see a neurologist, and they're claiming that they were going to be tested for MS, so I went through an MRI, I went through a spinal tap. Um, the neurologist in Windsor said it could be MS, but you know I'm not sure, too sure yet, so let's do a second MRI. Um, and that's when I started really getting and researching my own about MS and what it is and what it actually is and that no one really knows what it is. They know how it affects the brain but they don't know why. Mm -hmm. So that really resonated with me in the fact of, well, if they really don't know why, then I can change what I can change. Yes. So I went through a holistic way, talked to, I have a Reiki therapist, I've been doing Reiki, um, chakra balancing, and I started doing that. 
and just my whole mentality has changed and being more at peace and acceptance of anything that comes my way whether if I was sick or not and um, I found a lot of research on the Chinese believe that MS um, is a spiritual issue that you need to take care of something from your past or something in your aura spiritually that is affecting you physically where some, pe some people believe it's a virus um, some people don't really know what it is, it just happens yes. um, they found links with vitamin D deficiency, B12 deficiency um, I, got, I was tested for lupus you know, all, I was just, I was even just trying to get my own checklist going and saying what it is, like what it's not and, um, and still going through the meditation, going through writing things down like issues that I, I've had personally from my past uh, come back out and being ready to wash my hands clean of them Beautiful. and that has really opened my eyes to truly who I really am and uh, so I uh, through all of that we finally um, because I was the neurologist in Windsor was almost definite to say I had MS he wanted to do a second MRI but I wanted to get a second opinion. So I went and got the, uh, a number to the MS clinic in London mm -hmm. and got all of my medical records. I got my MRI, my CT scan, my blood work, everything. I went to the MS clinic there this past springtime and he says my spinal tap was fine mm -hmm. where the other guy said it wasn't. <laughs> so that was kind of a relief in the fact of that was okay. Blood test came back negative for lupus and or rheumatoid arthritis and B12 levels are fine, so that's good. And they're just a stickler on why I have lesions on my brain. So that even got me rolling the ball with the holistic side and going to see a shaman, which I absolutely love, which is an energy healer. And um, went and saw her because she was a, a nurse for 25 years, so she understands the medical side as well and studied shamanism in Peru, I believe, for nine years. And um, just sitting there talking with her was really just peaceful and talking with somebody who doesn't judge you or who doesn't say you have it or you don't have it and just trying to maybe figure out a different angle of what could be happening spiritually because I went to her um, with this issue and then some other issues and she's just like, well, this whole... MS issue, I believe, she's like, I feel that um, it was your father's doing in the fact of when he passed on, a part of him connected to you because when you get a soul attachment, you take on some of their characteristics when they passed on. Oh. So a lot of brain issues um, and a lot of um, just life changing. He's, she did say that he felt cheated why he died so early but he was there to help us, I guess, resonate into a new kind of life. And she's like, we need to clear that from you and make him and let him go on his own path. Let him go and do what he needs to do instead of staying here with you because it's just going to make you sicker, according to your med the medical field. So as she, like, she cleared me and cleared a lot of stuff and um, she taught me how to clear my aura and with the burning of the sage and how to protect myself um, from any lost soul because I guess when you get more spiritual you start to the light around you starts to grow shine brighter and brighter and um, a lot of the lost souls if you, if you believe in this a lot of the lost souls that are around you will come to you and try to grab all of that energy from you because they're there they think it's that light that they need to go to but it's really not, so you kind of guide them on a way, which is really interesting to me because I'm like thinking to myself, here I'm talking to the shamanism about this, and I have such a mathematical scientific mind that I'm just like, this makes absolutely no sense, but it felt right. Like, it, logically it didn't make sense, but my body was feeling like so much better. And what happened once you had the, um, the attachment of your father removed? Well, the next day I remember going back into school. It was the second last day in school. And usually it was like that time of year. It's very exhausting for teachers because it's the second last day of school. you got exams coming. 
And I remember when going into the school, I felt fantastic. Like, and everyone around me was, oh my gosh, Renee, you look fantastic. Like, what happened between yesterday and today? And I told them about my experience. And then all that day, I drank a lot of water because to ground yourself. Um, the side of me, I just felt a little suction, like something was being pulled away from me on this side. And then all of the tingling that was there had dissip dissipated. Mm -hmm. It was just like gradually, it's like a little wind going like this. And it was just felt weird because like I said before, when dad did pass away, I felt him around, like I felt him closer to me, which is weird to me as well. But now that she, when she cleared him of me, I really now felt I was back to who I was. Like I was Renee mm -hmm. and I wasn't like taking on these characteristics of dad or anything like that. So that's something I can't explain. Mm -hmm. So, and it's just going like with that and going with the shamanism, the holistic and the meditation. I look, you know, you, you research Buddhism, you research um, Hinduism and all that and try and just define peace yes. with yourself instead of trying to focus on, oh, I need to be happy, I need to be happy. I, I just internally find peace. And, the, and what I mean by that is you just accept what comes to you and whether it's good or bad, like we try to push pain down mm -hmm. and ignore pain because you're saying about that with the epidurals, you know, mm -hmm. like we try to negate the pain, but you, in a book, I believe it's the, um, Eckhart Tolle one, A New Earth, a new earth yeah. talks about if you don't have pain, you can't feel happy, happiness. You don't know the difference. Yes. So... I really accept anything that comes my way, and I really try to even teach my students that. <laughs> well, I should be teaching them math, but I really do teach them, you know, like, because they're always like, oh, why are you so happy, miss? Like, why are you so, you know, it's such a miserable day outside. But I'm like, what else can I do? You know, like, I really like to just be at peace and, you know, just be happy, because I think everything, once you get that mindset, Everything changes in your life. Things mm -hmm. don't have to be as hard as it is. And it has helped me realize our medical system of what I went through, that they're just human beings. Mm -hmm. And we put them up on a pedestal that they should know all. And they act like they know all, but they really don't. Because mm -hmm. there's some things in my life that I can't explain. And I would like to, scientifically, but I can't. So That's a beautiful statement. Mm -hmm. Do either of you have any suggestions for a, a person who is in the process of, of, of having someone very close to them die? Um, is that a broad, too broad of a question? Or? No, I because I remember being in that spot where like Dad was still alive and he was sick, but I knew he was going. And I remember like I'd run into people and I'd say, "Oh, my dad's not doing very well," or "My dad." Um, my dad, ha or I say, oh, my dad has passed, you know, like that sort of thing, like after the fact. And I remember when I'd meet people and they'd say, oh, my dad passed away too, or my mom passed away. My first instinct was, oh, they're still alive. You know, like the person that I'm talking to, I'm like, oh, they, they made it through. So if they can make it through, then I can make it through, yes. you know? And then now I feel, to me, I always think, the worst thing that anything, the worst thing that can ever happen to anybody is that they lose somebody that they love, you know, whether it be a father or a mother or a sister or a brother or a friend or a husband or a wife, right? Like to me, that's the ultimate. <laughs> Nothing gets worse than that. And I always feel like now I feel like, so like the worst thing that ever could happen has happened mm -hmm. to me, you know, and I'm still alive and mm -hmm. I'm, breathing and I'm I can still function and those sorts of things and um and I'm gonna and I am okay I, like I used to say and I can be okay and now I feel like I am okay you know and I think it's just with that like Renee talking about like you have to switch that mentality because I used to be very but I get it I think it just came up it comes from our upbringing I was very intri extrinsic feeling like all these bad things kept happening to me nothing ever worked for me, we, call, we used to call it the same care curse. <laughs> the same care curse, yeah. Because <laughs> nothing would go right for yeah. our family. But see, because you had that thought process and you yeah. had that yeah. negative energy. Yeah. That and comes out. Exactly. And when I started to, like, especially when I went back to school and started learning about intrinsic and extrinsic motivation yeah. and that sort of thing, 
it really, I really started to understand that, um, I, like, yeah, I mean, there are things that are going to happen in my life that I have absolutely no control over. But again, it's that, it's not how you fall, it's how you pick yourself up again, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so I started to really think about life that way and started to um, understand as well about energy and people around you and mm -hmm. and how people can really influence how you, you feel. Deal. And so I started to really not hang out with people yeah, anymore. It's true. You know, or like if people started to get too negative, I'm like, you know, especially after dad died, I was like, life is way too short to be around somebody like you, yeah, yeah. you know, and I just started to realize and I, you almost have to handpick the friends and the people that you want to be in your, in your circle and in your life and, and as tough as it can be, because you could have somebody who's been a friend for years and then all of a sudden you're like, you really are, are who I a good part of. You're not, you're not, you know, you're, you're messing with my energy. Like, yeah. you know, like that sort of thing. And so it's, it's become a big thing for me that way too, because I was very, not that I'm not acceptable now. Like I accept people for who they are. Um, but it really has, uh, cause I found I was on that same path as well. Like I got involved with a lot of not, I guess, yeah, like wrong people. I'll say like I was on paths where I was always getting uh, emotionally in trouble, we'll say, yeah. you know, like with boys and, and, you know, and friendships. And I was always, I always seemed to be the one that got hurt yes. at the end and that sort of thing. Right. Um, and then I started to realize that like, I believe now too, that people will come into your life to teach you something. Yes. And if you don't learn it that first time, another person's going to come and try and teach yeah. it to you until you finally figure it out, right? Because yeah. it hit me a couple, uh, just about a month or so ago, I was like, why does this always happen to me? You know, and yeah. then I finally realized, I was like, oh, maybe it's because I'm the, I'm, I need to step up. I need to shift something shift something i maybe it's because all these times people have come in and they've like screwed me over or they've you know like done something to to try to damage me and i've always let it happen yes. you know and so maybe i'm the one that needs to step it up and step up for myself because again talking about the self-confidence yes. and not having that confidence because i never wanted to hurt anybody's feelings um i didn't want anybody to be mad at me or that sort of thing and um but i think that uh, that stemmed a lot from when I was growing up and people made fun of me all the time, right? And, and I, I've always known what it's like to feel hurt and and sad and that sort of thing, right? And I've never wanted to put yes. that upon anybody, right? But then I also started to realize that um, if I don't... I'm, I'm, not, I'm not helping myself by not vocalizing. You know, if somebody really is hurting me, they need to know yes. that they're hurting me. Yes. And excuse me, and that is kind of, has been a new lesson for me just recently about being able to vocalize how I'm feeling, but also the fact that there is a way to vocalize without having to be destructive, Nice. you know, because I found like we grew up, like dad was very strict and it's my way or the highway mm -hmm. and, you know, so there was always that, um, I always felt restricted that way where I really, I, I couldn't always express how I felt because you know, it, um, maybe he didn't see it that way. So if, if, if he didn't see it that way, then it wasn't right. And, you know, and I really learned a lot about how, um, like, because I always felt that, um, I couldn't always share my ideas or, yes. you know, but being back in school and working on teams and groups and that sort of thing, really realizing that the more you work with people who are like-minded, yes. the more power there is to it, you know, cause you find, and I'm finding now that I'm running, especially with my pregnancy and just in the last couple of years, um, like people have been fall, not falling, but people have been coming into my life that are just amazing people. And I'm like, how, you know, like, and I just, and, and it's funny because, um, I've always felt like I, have been able to, you can feel people's energy, yes. you know, and, and when there is that negative energy or there's that positive energy, um, makes a huge difference. Like when you meet somebody and you're like, no, this mm. isn't a good idea. <laughs> or you meet somebody and it's like, wow, 
yeah this person's so amazing cool. you know mm -hmm. and it's just and then you all of a sudden you get those connections and then you, the world just seems so much better yes. when you've got those people, those people around you yeah. you know like it just it's because I feel like I, I've tried to really I've pushed out when like negative things and you know I don't watch the news I don't read the newspaper yeah. mm -hmm. you know because I'm like this is just junk mm -hmm. it's just junk and mm -hmm. nobody ever wants to talk about the good things nobody ever wants to talk about how much somebody loves somebody it's always about oh who did this to who and who did that mm -hmm. and it and I like when I see things about all oh, these um, predictions of the world's gonna end and I hear you know I see all these things and I'm just like I can't watch this mm -hmm. like I get so anxious and so upset I'm like I can't watch this I'm like it's so negative you know and I said I need to watch like the Care Bears or something <laughs> I, I feel for me that uh, I don't I probably haven't had just one single person who has offered inspiration um, it's been different people all over like I found, like I've I've met different people everywhere, and I pick up I pick up mm -hmm. from people's some, from different people's um, experiences, and um, and I always feel that I, like because I feel like people come into my life for a reason and to teach me something, and so when I, whenever somebody has said something to me or has I see somebody in a, in a moment, and and I'm like that's where I want to be, or that's how, that's how I want to think. And I just, I take that, and I just take it with me, and, and I go, and, uh, but I also think Renee has probably has been a huge inspiration for me, too, like, seeing, watching her and her transformation, because I, I, like, I've, I've always, I've always, not as much as I am now, but I've always been a bit of a spiritual person, but watching Renee change, oh like, just blossom into this beautiful spiritual person like I, I feel like I'm so proud and I like I finally feel like I've got somebody else on my side <laughs> you know like it's not that I'm against anybody but it just it just I feel that she's over on this side now and and we're able to just we've been able to grow and blossom together and we've mm -hmm. had our both our two different journeys but together we've been able to um just keep moving forward and and she like we build off of each other's uh, I think spirituality and learning is like I'll share my story and then she shares her story and I'm like wow that's so cool mm -hmm. and you know when she tells me about things I'm like that's what I want I want to feel that I want to experience that too mm -hmm. and yeah. and it just makes me feel like I want to keep going and going and learn more and um, and yeah and I think I guess as a final word of wisdom or inspiration is just follow like I know it sounds so cliche but it's like follow your heart and follow your soul and like you're they're not gonna lie no. to you you know like be truthful. yeah and I think that's what happens is people because they think oh I'm gonna look weird or I'm gonna sound weird if I actually talk about how I feel or mm. how you know like just who cares mm -hmm. you know like um because the more you open up to that yeah that mentality or that life of spirituality and love and, yeah. and kindness and peace like there's so many I've learned there's so many other people out there who are waiting just waiting to be woken up, to be woken up and because with me um, going into inspiration and final word even in the same thing um, as a teacher I get inspired by my students all the time like I have um, the applied level kids and they inspire me every day like what she was talking about they come to your life to teach you something like you, they choose you you don't choose those people that that walk around like they come into your life and that I learn something from them every day and what they've learned from me too is I don't judge and if there's anything I could teach anybody is judging people is just not gonna you know you're limiting yourself to what you can learn about somebody and what you can emotionally learn from somebody like I just opened up my heart to anybody so I've opened my heart and I think the students will respond to that and um, that they know that they can walk through my door anytime that I won't judge them as even as a teenager like cause I know there's some teachers that they're like oh my gosh teenagers or even people like how can you deal with teenagers every day I'm like well there's people you mm -hmm. know like they they have the same struggles as we did when we were in high school they have the same struggles it may be a little bit worse because of our society but they still need the adult guidance and the love and connection that you can give them 
And that's one thing I've learned in these last four years since dad's passed away is life's too short to, you know, just to judge people and make fun of people and, and put people down, you know, like we're all the same person. We're all one that no one's better than anybody else. And just be a self advocate for who you are and what you believe in and don't be afraid to follow, like Lisa said, follow your dreams, follow your heart. On that note, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to meet both of you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Renee and Lisa, thank you so much for spending the afternoon with me, for sharing your very personal story about the passing of your father. I think it's such a beautiful thing that both of you girls have done by sharing this information. Each and every one of us will be touched by death by someone very close to our hearts. And seeing the process that you went through, of course you had your mourning period, but that you took it as a catalyst for growth, that it was a transformative experience for you, is what it's all about. So thank you once again. Many blessings and much love.